Thank you, Prapan. Uh, I wanted to start by passing on my condolences for the passing of your king. Uh, and as uh, Prapan just said, I was invited to uh, present on recent basic research and its potential for clinical application. And I've rephrased that a little bit to talk about translation of basic research in HIV. So these are my potential conflicts of interest. So what I want to talk about this morning is really to try and define what translation is, or what my perception of translation is, what drives translation, and explain to you that this is not necessarily a linear or unidirectional process. I want to talk about the barriers to translation and what the steps are required for, for effective translation. And I want to give you some examples of success and some examples of failure, both in the realm of diagnostics and the di di in the realm of therapeutics and, and where we're going. And I want to talk a little bit in this highly systemized, when we think about this, it's highly systematized, but there is a role for serendipity in all this. So what are the steps to translation from basic research into clinical application? Well, it's a multi-step, time-consuming process that requires a very broad range of expertise. It starts with a discovery, and then, then that discovery needs to be independently confirmed. And then you need to work out a way of clinically exploiting that discovery. If you're developing a diagnostic, then there's a relatively well-trod path of getting robust techniques for the exploitation of this discovery, something that will work uh, no matter who does the assay in no matter what lab uh, does the assay. So getting away from the need for a green thumb to, to get an assay to work. You need commercial interest and a market for your, for your technique, and then you need to develop a commercial kit that's usable by uh, a broad range of laboratories, you need to validate and then verify the application of that kit in various laboratories, and then you need to get in vitro diagnostic approval, you need to have a distribution network, it needs to be affordable, and most importantly, you need someone to use it, and it needs to have real world utility. In terms of therapeutics, again, once you've had your discovery and you, you, you've worked out how to exploit it, you need to identify a market, you need to do extensive preclinical development, both in vitro and then in vivo in animal models. You need to work out how to manufacture that therapeutic at uh, GMP, and then you need to go through the phases of clinical trials that we're all very familiar with to make sure that your product is efficacious and non-toxic. And then you need to se seek regulatory approval, Again, you need to have a way of distributing your product. It needs to be affordable and accessible. And then you need the clinicians and the patient population to understand the clinical utility of your uh, therapeutic for it actually to be used. So there's a lot of ways of using drugs that never get used. And the traditional way of thinking about how this works is a linear pathway from the laboratory where someone makes a stunning discovery, a new insight, develops a technique to exploit that insight uh, that's effective and then takes that into the clinical research paradigm where it undergoes clinical testing through uh, uh, clinical studies or, or, uh, or uh, clinical trials uh, and the, the useful of the useful of of the, of the technique is, is confirmed and then implemented. And so this is a straightforward pathway, but in fact the way translation occurs is far more complex and it's actually an, often an intersection between uh, insights that are made in clinical research or population research or even implementation research and then those questions that are raised by that sort of research are fed back to people in the lab and said, we need this, we need you to develop this, and then people go away and develop that. And I guess a very good uh, example of that is the growth of point of care testing, where a clear need was identified through clinical and population-based research for point of care diagnostics, and techniques that were understood to convert these diagnostic kits into a laboratory-based tests were reassessed, re-evaluated in the laboratory and then reassessed in clinical research. 
So there's both a forward translation and a reverse translation, and the interaction is far more complex. And for translation to effectively occur, you need dialogue between all these sorts of researchers, not people working in isolation. So what are some of the examples of success? So nucleic acid testing is obviously something that has been extremely successful and has revolutionized the way we look after HIV. I want to just give you an example of how long these things take to get to the market, though. So multiplexed PCR was originally developed by a guy named John Elliott uh, in the mid-1990s. Uh, and he called that armed PCR, where he had multiple primers uh, uh, amplifying variants within his, uh, within his RNA. It's taken to the 2010 tens, 20 years later, before the very robust technique that he developed has become part of routine diagnostics we use for screening for respiratory and gut pathogens or for screening transplant patients for HIV, HCV and HPV. So a highly useful technique, but it took over 20 years to convert that into a diagnostic test, let alone a therapeutic. And similarly, not everything that is useful and appears useful actually gets prime time in the diagnostic laboratory or in, in, in clinical utility. So genetic-based uh, genetic sequence testing for resistance of HIV has clearly, uh, with the advent of bioinformatics and rules-based algorithms, has become front and center in the management of HIV, but plays a much smaller role in the, in the management of HCV because of the differences in the biology and clinical outcomes of treating these two infections. So although the technology is there and applicable, it's not necessarily, uh, does not use, necessarily translate into clinical utility. What are some of the other roadblocks to success? So clearly we have any number of ser serologically based assays to diagnose any number of infections. And the reason why serology has been so successful is that antibodies biologically are a very, very stable protein. They're a very robust media. You can store these at various temperatures and they're not going to degrade. And so you're going to, so, so you can batch assays, you can, uh, you can fiddle around with serum and you'll still get the right answer. By contrast, immunological tests based on cellular responses are far less commonly used. True, we have a range of phenotypic-based assays where we count the number of particular cell types, like a CD4 T cell count, which is highly important for the management of HIV, for phenotyping lymphoma and leukemias. But when it comes to functional assays, and actually understanding the output of these T cell assays and how they impact on clinical management and diagnosis, the field is very, very limited to really TB diagnostics. And even those have taken over 20 years to get some market penetrance. And because T cells uh, get unhappy very quickly and are not very robust when transported or stored, they, they're much more difficult tests to do in a diagnostic laboratory. And in fact, you have to recalibrate the way your technicians handle samples before you can successfully implement this, uh, this sort of technology in a laboratory. And it requires a whole uh, change in mindset. And furthermore, because T cells go off yeah, once they're outside the body, you need to do these assays real time. So there's much greater barriers to the translation of cell-based assays. And, and I challenge you to think of a B-cell-based functional assay. But we are pushing back on this, and, and there have been really significant advances where serology meets uh, molecular biology, uh, bioinformatics, microarray, high-throughput technology. And one of the great examples of this was published uh, in 2015 uh, in science, and it was called, and they they called this technique VIRSCAN, which is a, a complex, uh, very sophisticated ass serological assay that can screen populations for exposures to a whole ranges of viruses. It's a very high throughput uh, uh, platform. The validation and verification uh, samples for this 
came, many of those samples came from, from Thailand and in fact from people sitting in this room. Uh, and it, and it, it really contrasts uh, the, uh, the way traditional serology is done, which is dependent on the choice of very specific antigens that will uh, define an antibody response to this virus versus that virus. This achieves its sensitivity by assaying the complete proteome of any virus you choose via phase, phase display and then detecting the antibodies directed to anything that binds to one of those peptides expressed by the phages. Its specificity depends on a complex bioinformatics algorithm. And the great advantage of this is that it allows rapid identification of exposure to less well-studied viruses within populations. And it can be rapidly extended to new viruses even when you don't really understand the protein structure within those viruses or its biology. Once you know its sequence, you can start doing this sort of screening. So it potentially is a very powerful tool for population-based epidemiological studies and for tracking epidemics, but its role in routine diagnostics is still to be defined. What are some other examples of success? Let's look at therapeutics and how we've had that success. Protease inhibitors are a clear uh, example of that, and the development of the protease inhibitors was a very systematic approach where the protease uh, molecule from HIV was crystallized, the structure was understood at fine detail, and specific molecules were designed to fit into the, uh, the active site and inhibit that molecule. Furthermore, as we understood that molecule more and more, it allowed the generation of second and third uh, generation protease inhibitors that would work against even resistant virus and has spawned uh, you know, the current uh, state-of-the-art protease inhibitors that we use. This model of uh, understanding the structure of an enzyme and specifically designing uh, molecules to inhibit it have then driven the, uh, the HIV integrase inhibitor development and all the DAAs for HCV. So this has been a very powerful mechanism for drug development with broad application. Why can't we use that to develop a HIV vaccine? We, can, we know that we can make monoclonal antibodies and we know we can make monoclonal antibodies that are broadly neutralizing to HIV. We now know how to do high throughput screening from B cells for anti-HIV activity. We know how to identify the clones. We need, know how to isolate the sequences that make the antibodies in those clones and then clone those and use those to make high amounts of neutralizing antibodies. How do we translate these monoclonal antibodies that are so powerful in the test tube against HIV into the clinic? Well, it's not clear. Should we be using these as passive immunization for prevention? Should we be using them to clear the reservoir? Should we be using them simply as a guide to develop our vaccines? Or should we be using them as a guide for developing gene therapy? There are roadblocks to the use of these monoclonal antibodies. If you use them as single agents, you get virus escape, just like you get if you use single agents in antiretroviral therapy. And their half-life is relatively short, which means you have to keep administering them over and over again, and they have to be administered uh, uh, intradermally or, or intravenously. So they're not easily, to, and they're not easily administered. We're able to develop these monoclonal antibodies in the test tube. We're able to synthesize them artificially, but we're not able to induce them by vaccine. And this is despite the fact that we do understand a lot about the envelope structure in the same way that we understand a lot about the protease or integrase structure. But the envelope structure is probably far more complex than the protease or integrase structure. It has a much more variable sequence. It's a multimeric mo molecule. That multimer, that trimer, is held together by non-covalent uh, associations. That structure is dynamic. It changes as it binds ligands. It's highly glycosylated, protecting the peptide epitopes. It's a far more uh, difficult target. And what's more, what we're trying to do with a vaccine is use that envelope structure to generate an immune response. And despite the fact that I'm an immunologist and out and proud, I have to say that you know, we still really don't understand what, what happens in the follicles in terms of T cells and B cell interaction to generate the neutralizing antibodies, these broad neutralizing antibodies. 
we're starting to understand that, but our understanding of this complex interaction is still in its infancy. And furthermore, even within the body, humans are pretty poor at producing these, these neutralizing antibodies. A lot of people never produce them, and those that do take a long time to produce them. So they're difficult things to produce even in nature, let alone to mimic that process. So how are we breaking, what are the, how are we breaking down these roadblocks to translating our knowledge about monoclonal antibodies and neutralizing antibodies into a vaccine? Well, we've defined the epitopes pretty exhaustively. The field is defining the antibody structure of these monoclonal antibodies. We understand the light and heavy chains used. We understand the extent of somatic hypermutation and the length of the CDR3 uh, regions that are required to generate these neutralizing antibodies. We understand how far these have evolved from the germline. What we don't understand is how exactly how that evolution has occurred what the interactions between the envelope and the immune system are to drive that evolution towards one of these broadly neutralizing antibodies. But again, there have been some advances in the last year with this through the use of humanized mice and very uh, elegant techniques of using different envelopes to drive in these humanized mouse models uh, and the, the development of, of neutralizing uh, antibodies. So the barriers are being broken down and at the same time there are, uh, we're increasing our understanding about how follicular T helper cells interact with B cells to help this process. So there is some hope but there's a lot of work still to be done. So we're sort of stalled in generating neutralizing antibodies within the body naturally. So some people have decided to bypass this altogether and to use gene therapy instead. And this is a really intriguing approach where people use gene therapy uh, to uh, make a fusion molecule that blocks the function of the envelope, blocks its binding to HIV and blocks its entry of, of HIV into the target cell. So this is a fusion protein that is uh, uh, made up of certain domains of CD4, the CD4 molecule that binds the envelope. It contains a mimetope that mimics uh, uh, the block CCR5, and these are fused to stabilize it to the FC portion of an, uh, of an IgG antibody. So the genetic material is put into an adenovirus or an adeno-associated virus that's transduced into cells and then produces this fusion protein. And this fusion protein, at least in macaques, protects the macaques from infection for periods up to three months. So this is very promising and bypasses all those issues about having to make the monoclonal antibodies. And this fusion protein has affinities for uh, and, and efficacy, at least in vitro, at, at least those of, uh, of neutralising antibodies. However, the long-term production of these uh, 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 these fusion proteins within the body using these vectors is still something that needs to be determined. David is probably going to kill me for putting this slide up, but we can learn from failures as well. So, you know, IL-2 therapy was based on some very early observations by Cliff Lane about the deficits of IL-2 production from CD4 cells in people with HIV AIDS. And we also knew that IL-2 is a strong growth factor for T cells and boosts cytotoxic T cell function. So the hypothesis was that if you gave exogenous IL-2, it will reverse the, the functional T cell defect and people will get better. And certainly in phase one and phase two trials, we got very large increases and sustained increases in CD4 T cells. However, smaller studies showed, questioned whether there was a change in T cell function and Irene Soretti showed that a lot of the cells that were produced actually had a regulatory phenotype. And when this went to phase three, we got the expected increases in CD4 cell, but no improvement in clinical outcome, essentially because the T cells were not effector cells and didn't provide any protection, didn't provide a reconstitution of the immune system functionally, although it looked like it from counting cells. So a plausible hypothesis failed in its translation because Although we had some understanding of the effects of exogenous IL-2 at a biological uh, level in vivo, we didn't have a complete understanding of what was involved. So, what, uh, so in terms of translation success, we've had success 
when the translation is based on virological targets, when the interventions are specifically designed to interfere with specific biological fu functions of three enzymes within the virus, RT integrase and protease. Our success at intervening, uh, at, even at this more simple level of the virus level, have been limited, uh, as demonstrated by our ability to make uh, neutralizing antibodies by vaccines. Where we've tried to manipulate the immune system, which is far more complex and, we ha and uh, dynamic and polymorphic, we've had much less success in translating. So the complexity of the target impacts on translation. What does this tell us about translating cure research? Well, trans cure, uh, transcription of HIV is, a, is complex, and it has complex interactions between the virus and host. Some of the viral factors are shown there. The host factors are epigenetic and depend on histone structure, histone biochemistry, transcription factor availability, post-translational uh, states of uh, transcription factors. And then it further it, it, it depends on the interaction between the host and the virus, the site of integration, the orientation of integration, and the activation state of those cells. This is just a cartoon to show you the number of transcription, human transcription factors that interact with the HIV promoter. You can see there are multiple there, each in a different color. When we intervene with HDAC inhibitors, as was described by Nicholas Chamont and uh, Sharon Lewin yesterday, we're interfering with one part of this process. We interfere with histone acetylation, that part of the epigenetics. This causes a non-specific activation of virus, both dead virus and replication competent virus, but it also activates host genes that are epigenetically regulated. And as Nicholas pointed out yesterday, it can decrease cytotoxic T cell function and increase T regulatory cell function. So what we really need is an intervention that differentiates between host genetics and viral genetics. So one way to do this is through gene therapy, and people have tried to do this with zinc finger nucleases, CRISPR-Cas, SISHRNAs, to uh, induce fine specificity of this process, but then they're prone to escape and resistance. But the other barrier to gene therapy and cure is that we don't have the right mechanisms to deliver these, this gene therapy to the right cells. Getting gene therapy with our current lentiviral vectors into resting T cells and resting myeloid cells where the latent reservoir is, is extremely difficult. I just, so I think the lessons from this are that the rates of success are greater for virologically based interventions than immunological based interventions. Success is associated with simpler systems and a more complete under and accurate understanding of this process. The complexity of the target and a gaining of a true and complete understanding of the biology is a basic roadblock to successful translation of, of these insights. But the power of high throughput assays and bioinformatics will make an increasing contribution to our ability to translate basic uh, research. But ongoing basic research, both systematic and serendipitous, are essential for both the advancement of translation of both vaccine and cure research. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tony. So it's my honor to introduce the next speaker, uh, the co-founder of uh, HIPNET, Professor David Cooper, the director of the Kirby Institute at uh, uh, Sydney. Uh, he's going to give us a talk on recent uh, 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 HIV clinical researches and as and, and its uh, potential clinical implications. David, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, in the... Uh, in the Jewish religion, uh, when someone dies, um, it's traditional to wish the surviving relatives, um, uh, the, the um, sons and daughters of a parent or the husband or wife of the deceased, uh, there's a traditional greeting uh, which is to wish them long life. Um, and uh, I think it's a very nice greeting. It seems to me that the uh, late uh, King of Thailand was very much like family uh, to you. Uh, and in that context, I'd like to wish you all uh, long life. Thank you. Okay, so what, I, um, what I've been asked to do is uh, clinical uh, 
uh, clinical translation. Um, I'm just going to give you some examples and, uh, uh, and show how that has really changed how we treat people with HIV. I think one of the first large strategy studies which uh, helped us define that was the SMART study. Um, uh, the late Yu Blanga called it the stupid study, but um, <laughs> I, I don't think that uh, it turned out that way. Um, and uh, basically it randomised over 5,000 people to uh, two strategies, one of drug conservation which deferred the use of antiretroviral therapy versus uh, a continuous use of antiviral therapy. The reason for this was in the time when it started, which was the late 90s, there was considerable toxicity of antiretroviral therapy. Uh, and it was hoped that the uh, drug conservation strategy, which really allowed to people to stop therapy but to keep the CD4 count around 3 to 400, uh, would prevent some of the toxic effects of antiretroviral therapy. Um, it was a huge surprise that uh, the study was stopped early, and it was stopped early uh, because of two things. Firstly, the primary endpoint of opportunistic disease or death uh, was in favour of the viral suppression group. So you can see the rate, the event rate in the viral suppression group uh, was about a third of the event rate in the drug conservation group, the intermittent therapy group. But what really turned us on our heads uh, and really made us sit up and take notice uh, was that the very events which we were hoping would be less with ongoing antiretroviral therapy, the major cardiovascular, renal and hepatic events uh, were in fact uh, more and statistically significantly more, almost twofold, uh, in the people who had um, drug conservation, in other words, intermittent antiretroviral therapy. Uh, it turned out um, that uh, it was due to the fact that uh, the HIV virus was pro inflammatory uh, and pro coagulopathic. And so when HIV was not suppressed, uh, it was causing havoc in inflammation and coagulation. And this is very well illustrated by the biomarker uh, studies that were associated with SMART, uh, and particularly the two bio major biomarkers of inflammation, IL-6, um, and the major biomarker of coagulation, D-dimer, uh, which showed a dramatic uh, uh, increased risk, uh, the higher the level, uh, for the development of, of all-cause mortality. And of course these biomarkers were much higher in people who were off antiretroviral therapy. Um, and so overnight, overnight, HIV was transformed into a disease which we thought of as an immunodeficiency, opportunistic infections, opportunistic cancers, yeah, into a disease that was associated with inflammation. And HIV does a lot of its mischief, particularly in earlier disease, by increasing uh, inflammation throughout the body uh, by, uh, for example, uh, a, when it wipes out the gut T lymphocytes to uh, allow microbial products uh, across into the circulation causing um, uh, the, the virus itself causes uh, lymphoid tissue damage. Um, it causes uh, monocyte and macrophage activation um, and it causes pro-inflammatory effects like uh, atherosclerosis and probably is associated with um, increased multimorbidity and aging. Uh, and so as a result of that study, overnight, uh, we changed the way we give antiretroviral therapy into giving it uh, continuously. The problem that's vexed us since the beginning of antiretroviral therapy is when to start. And I remember these discussions were quite robust even in the time of AZT monotherapy. 
um, and there were proponents like the original uh, David Ho hit hard, hit early, um, that we should start antiretroviral therapy early. Um, and the problem was, of course, that the antiretroviral therapy at that time was not sufficient and was quite toxic. Uh, but by the time we had good antiretroviral therapy, good suppressive therapy, it was time to answer the when to start question. Um, and there was all sorts of cohort data which supported the notion of starting early, but there was never any proof on the balance between efficacy and safety of um, long-term antiretroviral therapy. So the START study was uh, designed. Um, uh, again, over 5,000 people, uh, uh, including patients here in Thailand, uh, run through HIVNAT, um, uh, randomizing people to, inter uh, to immediate antiretroviral therapy starting over 500 versus deferring um, to less than 350, which was thought to be a reasonably safe level at the, um, at the time. Again, uh, the, uh, so th this was the primary composite end, uh, target of over 200 endpoints and we were looking at AIDS, AIDS and death and uh, uh, all the serious non-AIDS events. Uh, again, the study was stopped early and it was stopped early uh, because of a very dramatic benefit of immediate ART uh, over deferred ART, and you can see there was a, an over 50-fold, uh, sorry, an over 50% reduction uh, in the risk of getting uh, the primary endpoint um, AIDS death or serious non-AIDS events. Uh, in the developing world, uh, the, uh, the AIDS events were predominantly tuberculosis. Uh, in the first world, uh, the AIDS events were predominantly cancer events. Uh, and this completely resolved the debate that had been raging for years and years and years about when to start. Um, uh, clearly there was no increase in toxicity from the antiretroviral therapy and uh, it was pretty rapidly within a few months translated into the WHO consolidated guidelines uh, whereby combination antiretroviral therapy uh, should be initiated in all adults uh, living with HIV regardless of WHO clinical stage and regardless of any CD4 cell count. So never, I think, in the history of HIV has a recommendation uh, been so rapidly uh, translated into, um, into guidelines and, and completely cleared up the argument of um, when to start. Uh, just before the START study, um, the other, the, the third, I think, most important study um, of strategy trials done in HIV, so SMART, START, and this one, HPTN052, um, uh, described by science as the breakthrough of the year when it was published a few years ago, um, was basically uh, a, a study designed to see whether early treatment in discordant couples um, could prevent uh, sexual transmission to the uninfected partner. So the study was set up to treat people early uh, because at the time uh, the guidelines were that you could not not treat people with lower CD4 cell counts so they had to have a reasonable CD4 cell count and they were randomised to treat early uh, versus delay. And there were two primary endpoints. One was transmission uh, and the other was um, uh, the various clinical, uh, clinical events. Uh, the results again were dramatic, absolutely dramatic. There were 39 transmission events in this, um, in this uh, randomised trial. And through phylogenetics, uh, it was shown that there were 28 transmissions linked, in other words, linked in the serodiscordant couple that the, the HIV positive person uh, had given the same virus to the HIV negative partner. Uh, and this was separated in that the delayed arm, the persons who are not on antiretroviral therapy, 27 events versus only one event in the immediate arm. And this is extraordinarily, of course, highly statistically significant. Notwithstanding, and this is one of the things that we have to think about, is of course people don't necessarily have 
sex with only one uh, regular partner. Uh, and there were unlinked transmissions um, in uh, 11, uh, 11 cases. Uh, most of the transmissions occurred in sub-Saharan Africa um, and uh, many of the transmissions were from female to, um, uh, to male. Um, the important thing here is that um, when you think about the unlinked transmissions, you begin to think how important it is for high-risk HIV negative people uh, to, to undergo prevention. Um, so just going back one sec, so the, uh, the guidance here again almost immediately taken up by WHO as the recommendation that people in serodiscordant relationships, um, the positive partner should go on antiretroviral therapy again regardless of CD4 cell count and this was very, very rapidly translated. So these three strategy trials are rated by Dr. Tony Fauci, the director of NIAID, as the most important strategy trials ever in the uh, HIV field. Um, and in summary, SMART shifted the paradigm away from HIV as an immunodeficiency uh, to a disease associated with immune activation, inflammation and coagulopathy. Uh, start clearly resolved the question of when to start in favour of treatment for all. And HPTN 052 uh, showed that HIV transmission was dramatically prevented by combination antiretroviral therapy and was a, a, an amazing confluence harmonising treatment and prevention benefits of antiretroviral therapy. So the person with HIV gets a double benefit that he, he or she has a benefit for uh, his or her own health as well as a benefit in the public health sense of preventing transmission uh, to loved ones and partners. Okay, so just moving on to treatment optimization. Uh, and talking about reduced doses of antiretroviral drugs. Um, the Global Fund, PEPFAR, WHO, UNAIDS have plans to expand uh, this treatment. Uh, I guess there's about 18 million people in, around the world on treatment. We need to expand to about 33 million. That's going to come at significant cost. Uh, although reduced, uh, the costs of our V regimens remain substantial and it's related to the cost of the ingredients, the, um, uh, the, the pharmaceutical uh, compound that is used to produce the antiretroviral drug and that is, has a baseline expense. So that if you can reduce the amount of that that you need to make the drug, that should reduce the drug costs. Uh, and the, the main target for this was a Favarin's, which in phase two um, uh, and observational cohort data had suggested that lower daily doses of the drug would be um, efficacious. On that basis, we set up the Encore One study, um, which was a global study in, um, uh, in the South, in South America, in Africa, and in Asia, um, uh, coordinated by the Kirby with sponsorship from the Gates Foundation. Uh, and we randomized people to the standard dose of efavirenz, 600 milligrams a day versus 400 milligrams a day. Um, uh, over, over 600 people on a tenofovir FTC backbone. Uh, the results, uh, again, were very, very clear cut, whether you looked at less than 200 copies, less than 50 copies, intention to treat, uh, per protocol, non-complete or equals failure. Uh, in all circumstances, there was no difference between the 600 and the 400 uh, milligrams in terms of efficacy. Uh, notwithstanding, uh, there was a, uh, an important difference in adverse events in that when you looked at the efavirenz related adverse events as set out in the uh, product insert, um, the people on 400 milligrams a day had uh, reduced adverse events, statistically significant, not a 
dramatic difference, but nevertheless less uh, in terms of the well-known uh, CNS side effects of uh, efavirenz. Uh, so this requires implementation. Uh, it's clearly non-inferior with fewer efavirenz related side effects. It's been recommended by WHO in the latest consolidated guidelines as an alternative first-line regimen. Um, it, uh, uh, the, for those who still suffer CNS toxicity on 400 milligrams, uh, although it's by and large manageable and usually settles down, there are alternatives available for people who are intolerant. There's still questions remaining about the use of 400 milligrams of efavirenz, whether that's efficacious in the last trimester of pregnancy with lower drug levels, um, and whether you can still use that dose with rifampicin in, in HIV TB co infection. Uh, and again, studies are underway to validate that. Um, and these outcomes have uh, result in rapid transition through the normative WHO treatment guidelines very quickly after the results of the trial became known a year or two ago, uh, recommending routine dose of, uh, reduced dose of efavirenz. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the Indian pharmaceuticals, particularly Mylan, are arranging to produce a fixed dose combination of tenofovir 3TC uh, and efavirenz. Um, the, it is uh, interesting how this is being rapidly taken up by some countries in Africa um, to move to 400 milligrams a day of efavirenz. Uh, and last week I was, um, uh, sorry, earlier this week I was in Myanmar uh, and MSF, who runs most, a lot of the treatment rollout in, uh, in Myanmar, uh, is uh, routinely using 400 milligrams of efavirenz. Uh, for people on antiretroviral therapy in Myanmar. So a very important uh, advance. Um, lastly, the uh, LASA study, uh, which uh, was done by HIVNAT in Thailand. Um, this took 560 adults uh, over 18, randomised one to one uh, to uh, two different doses of atazanavir, 200 milligrams a day, ritonavir boosted versus 300 milligrams a day. And this is on the basis that Hivnat and particularly Professor Prapan always believed that smaller uh, Asian people didn't need the same kind of doses uh, of antiretrovirals as bigger uh, Caucasian people. Uh, and so this study was done in people who were stable on antiretroviral therapy, often on uh, suppressed on protease inhibitors with two nucleosides, um, and this was the randomization. Uh, the primary endpoint was less than 200, and it was a non-inferiority design. Um, so these are the results, uh, and very, very interestingly, uh, although the intention to treat analysis was no different, uh, in the non-complete or equals failure analysis, which tends to reflect toxicity, um, the 200 milligrams of atazanavir uh, was uh, better. And as well as in the less than 50, uh, less than 50 copies, statistically significantly better. Uh, and as you can see, the reason that it was better in the non-complete or equals failure uh, was the fact of side effects, uh, particularly in smaller, uh, smaller people of increased jaundice, increased rash, uh, um, <coughs> and overall uh, discontinuations. Uh, so it's not unreasonable on the basis of this study to recommend in the region 200 milligrams of atazanavir. Um, the main difficulty is that this was not a naive study, uh, and so whether you can start people on 200 milligrams of atazanavir remains moot, um, but it is something that we could uh, still uh, look at. Okay, so I think I've shown you some uh, extraordinary examples uh, in terms of strategy trials and in terms of reduced, uh, reduced doses of antiretroviral therapy in which uh, uh, these sort of trials, well thought out and well executed, uh, has resulted in uh, very rapid and important changes in 
uh, clinical guidelines which have been uptaken very, very quickly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, David, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry, I'm very confusing. Uh, so we have heard about applications of the either basic research or clinical research into clinical practice. But sometimes we cannot convince policy makers how to use those research findings into, in terms of policy. So the one that will come to the, tell us about how to translate research findings into policy is Professor Frank Kobelens. Professor Kobelens is a professor of medicine at the Academic Medical Center, or AMC, at University of Amsterdam. He's a director of this uh, Amsterdam Institute of Global Health and Development, AIGHD. So he has been involved mainly in epidemiology, especially TB, a TB in Vietnam, for example. So he's going to use his experience to tell us about how to put the findings into policy. Frank, please. Thank you for this introduction. Good morning to all of you. And let me start also by expressing my condolences for the passing of the king. Um, indeed, I'm going to talk about tuberculosis because that's what I know about, much less about HIV. Um, and I realize that as the expression is, I may be bringing owls to Athens because I think the HIV world has been perhaps much more effective in translating research into policy than has been the TB world, I think especially here in Thailand, but nonetheless, maybe, maybe I can give a few examples that may be of use to you as well. So we've seen over the past um, uh, 100 years, we've seen a tremendous growth of scientific evidence, and the question of course is, does that all uh, translate into policy and then how? And there's been a re uh, an, an, a, what I think a highly recommended uh, 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 series of papers out recently in this journal, Health Research Policy and Systems, by the group by Anderman, that sort of analyzed this phenomenon. How do you bring evidence into policy? How do you translate it? They identify four major groups of barriers. One is missing the window of opportunity, which means that if you want research evidence to be picked up in policy, you have to make sure it's available at the right time when a decision is to be made and that it's in the right format, not in research papers, but for example in policy briefs. Um, another barrier is that there are almost always knowledge gaps and uncertainties in the evidence, which basically means that one has to provide to policymakers evidence on what works in specific settings or for specific groups that they're concerned about. There can be barriers with regard to controversies, irrelevance, and conflict in the, in the evidence. And, um, and the authors recommend then that we should ensure that evidence addresses the main questions that policymakers have. I'll come back to that. And then finally, of course, there may be vested interests and conflict of interests, and of course, that calls for independent research and acknowledging those conflict of interests. In this regard, I declare none. And I'm going to, in my presentation, I'm going to say, try to say a little bit about the first three. But not before making this remark that decision-making is a dynamic and nonlinear process. And scientific evidence, what we are concerned about, is only one type of input that goes into the process. It's a much more complex process. So we sort of almost always have to elbow our way in a little bit with the policymakers. Now, the perspective I'm going to take, and you've seen this already in the first presentation, the perspective I'm going to take is if you look at the, at the, at the, research, and the, uh, the, the, the research and development the value chain, that it's actually here in evaluation and implementation where the policy relevance is. And I make the distinction as far as we can make it between evaluation and implementation, saying that evaluation is more like trials, it's more like, like um, um, new, basically new interventions. And the relevance and the scope is primarily at the global level, one would say, whereas implementation is much more what happens at the local level. And here, much of the research is actually about what in TB we call program deficiencies and, potential, and, and improvements in, in, in uh, program performance. So I'm going to talk about both, and I'm going to do that in the following way. I'll first explain you a little bit about research for policy in tuberculosis, then about translating research on program deficiency and improvements, then about translating research on new interventions. And then I'll give an example of the scale-up of expert, uh, the, the expert test, and then finally some conclusions. So let me start with the first. So 
the TB community over the last years has put increasing emphasis on research, and that actually started with the second half of the uh, global plan to stop TB, which ran until 2015, in which there was actually, which the plan actually had a research agenda, which was costed. It actually said, what we need is this, and it's going to cost so much. And that was, uh, that was laid down in this uh, international roadmap for tuberculosis research, which is basically a research agenda across all disciplines, and also a, uh, a, a roadmap for, WHO loves roadmaps, for priorities in operational research. And just to give you an example of what kind of things were in that, that uh, document, uh, all sorts of guidance about how to do this. Um, for example, this is the cycle of research activities for improved access screening and diagnosis of tuberculosis. And then it, this is the, the research cycle starts with the situation analysis, then identify new approaches, pilot uh, the implementation of them, and then evaluate them and, 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 um, and see what needs to be improved. And then the document gives all sorts of guidance about how to do this. Now, in its new strategy, which has started uh, last year, uh, the NTB strategy, you will hear more about that in the afternoon presentation I'll be giving about tuberculosis. Research is actually one of the three pillars. So it's the one on the right, intensified research and innovation. So, so there is a very clear awareness that research is very important in, in tuberculosis and in ending the tuberculosis epidemic. Looking at research for program deficiencies and improvements, I'm going to give two examples where we were somehow involved in through uh, uh, collaborative work we are doing with an NGO in the Netherlands uh, in, in, in tuberculosis control, which is called Kane CV Tuberculosis Foundation. This is one from Indonesia, where over a period of 10 years a, uh, an operational research initiative was evaluated. That had, that had established a TB operational research group at national level to set a research agenda and to coordinate operational research. Um, had carried out over that period 56 research projects in, as you can see on the, on the map, in various parts of this huge country and on the various topics, which is the graph below. And interestingly, all those project teams were collaborative, so they always had someone from the to be control program, so someone of the end users, or you could say the policy makers on the one hand and academia on the other. And it was disseminated through various means, and I think that was to some extent key to its success, because many of these things were translated into national or local policy, like policy briefs and annual, annual to be research symposia, published compilations of such results and communication education tools, and you see a couple of uh, examples of those uh, on the bottom. And then an, an, an another example from Ethiopia, where uh, the, this TB operational research initiative was established that aimed at addressing national and regional priorities in TB control through operational research. And there was a very systematic approach, first assessed capacity, collaboration, structures and so on, and then started setting up a national TB research agenda, uh, made sure that there was leadership and mentorship, partnerships and so on, and uh, then built capacity for doing those kinds of studies, but also for, for, for making grants and the ethics and dissemination part. And here, because it was evaluated, and here the keys to success were ownership by the Federal Ministry of Health, very important, so the policy makers are to a large extent in the driving seat of the research that needs to be done. There was, and second, uh, having a tuberculosis research advisory committee where all stakeholders are involved. Having a national research agenda based on an analysis of the problems in the country having a competitive grant scheme for operational research projects, having mentorship through, for example, KZV and the, and the union, and then having the findings presented in the early stage to and discussed with the uh, regional health bureaus, which are implementing TB control at the grassroots level. And this sort of approach has now fed into the NTB strategy in its research pillar. And this is a the global framework that came out last year, which not only call, calls for global advocacy for research, but also for national to be research plans, including national to be research networks, country specific agendas, and so forth. Now, about new interventions. I'm sorry, this is perhaps not a perfect slide, but this is the great process. You've probably heard about this is what WHO does uh, for its guideline development. So it's basically 
collecting the evidence through evidence synthesis, systematic reviews, discussing them in a panel, grading the evidence by, by, by its quality and its applicability, and then coming up with those guidelines, and, recomm and then recommendations are made with a particular sort of level of strength, and also indicating what the quality of the evidence is. So it's a, it's a, it's a rigorous and very transparent process, which is, which is great, uh, but it has some, in the end, it has some limitations, because the question is, does a guideline always translate into implementation of the intervention? Does it mean that countries or, or, or other implementers are going to pick it up? And that depends on what policymakers want to know. So this is a list of what policymakers generally need to know. They need to know what's the pri what is the priority health problem, what causes the problem, what are different strategies or interventions. Which of those options compared to the status quo has an added benefit that outweighs the harms? Which options could be acceptable to the individuals or populations involved? Would these options be feasible and sustainable in that specific context? What are the costs? What are the opportunity costs? What are the e ethical, legal and social implications of choosing one option over another? What do stakeholders stand to gain or lose from each option? And then sort of integrating all this, taking into account the multiple perspectives and considerations involved, which option is most likely to improve health while minimizing harms. And the, and the great process is actually only about this number four in blue, which of the options have, has an added benefit. And the other ones are, I mean, they are sort of addressed by the, by the, by the, by, by the great process, but there's, not, there's no formal framework for doing that within the process. So acceptability, feasibility, sustainability, and especially cost are not in there, which means that the final question can actually not be answered just by, based on the great process. And that has been, that to me, that has been one of the reasons why, for example, until, it's better now, but this is data from 2010, isolated preventive treatment in, 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 in people living with HIV had a very slow uptake, especially in the first years. The, the recommendation guideline had been out by WHO for years and had a very slow uptake, as you can see here. And that, br that made us think, and we developed a sort of framework, and we said what we actually need to have is evidence for scale-up of new interventions. And, and this is, to us, this is about three things. The first question is, is it scalable? Which means, does the intervention that showed e efficacy in a trial, for example, retain effectiveness when it's brought to scale? So this is about, what does it do under real-life conditions? Is it feasible? Is it acceptable? What are its adverse consequences? Is it worth scaling up? What is its cost effectiveness and affordability when applied to scales? So that's about monetary cost, non-monetary cost, and, and for example, looking comparatively at, at cost for various ways of, of implementation. And you may wonder why, and because you see more about cost effectiveness, you may wonder why, why is this guy talking about cost? That is because in tuberculosis, cost is elementary, because TB is a poverty disease, there is no market pool from rich countries, which means that cost effectiveness, and much of the funding is donor funding, cost effectiveness is always a major consideration in TB. It's a poverty disease, it's the archetypal poverty disease. And of course the last question, how should it be scaled up? What are its key delivery aspects? What are the operational bottlenecks? What defines in the end its access and uptake? And Together with that, you can sort of think about the different ways of obtaining that evidence. And you, and, and you could look at that from the objective of the research that's being carried out, whether it's more about efficacy or more about effectiveness and feasibility. From the design perspective, randomized trials versus, on the other hand, highly pragmatic designs whether the methodology is primarily quantitative or more qualitative, whether the setting is a research setting where we do clinical trials or more routine setting where things are always messier, whether it's what the level of generalizability is, should it be a cross setting or should it set, be setting, setting specific and as, a, as, a, as an implication, whether the, whether the relevance is more global or more local. And this is what the great process is about, whereas this is what policymakers at country level are interested in. So this is clearly a... Uh, uh, a, a, a problem if we only use the guidelines. So we looked at that and we did, a, we did a systematic review looking at a number of interventions that had been recommended by WHO over the years and this is again the example of isolated preventive therapy. So we looked at various types of studies and the, and the color bars indicates various areas of the world where these studies had been done and you can see that comparative effectiveness studies, um, so like 
pragmatic trials, had, there had been a few done, but not very many. Uh, there had been a few non-comparative uh, effectiveness studies as well, but mainly in sub-Saharan Africa. Delivery studies, only a few non-comparative ones. So comparative would be, would be, for example, a pragmatic trial of various ways of delivering it. And there had been hardly any cost-effectiveness studies done, by which I mean but using real-life costing and effectiveness data, not just some sort of modeling with data that you, that you get out of the literature. And over the same period, there had actually been 16 individual randomized trials of research and it showed that, 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 it, that it would work, but it wasn't taken up. So I'm going to give you briefly some uh, examples of the scale-up of the expert test. So you probably know what this is. So gene expert test is a within cartridge, real-time PCR that gives very quickly results. It tests for M tuberculosis as well as rifampin resistance. WHO endorsed it in 2010 based on data on accuracy and turnaround times from routine settings in six countries. It was this paper here in the Lancet. And what you see uh, in the graph is sensitivity. You see that sensitivity, both in HIV negative and HIV positive patients, is much better, especially in the HIV positives with expert compared to smear examination. Uh, and there have been numerous studies since, studies that sort of confirmed this in other populations, studies that looked at children, studies that looked at, uh, at non-respiratory samples. Uh, and they all went into the great process, which led to uh, this recommendation in 2010 to use expert as the initial diagnostic test in adults suspected of MDR TB or HIV associated TB. And in 2013 was revised and updated to recommend uh, uh, expanded scale up to children uh, with the also suspected of MDR TB or HIV uh, TB, patients suspected of TB meningitis, and in, if resources would allow basically all adults, so basically the initial tests, uh, all children and all non-respiratory samples in patients suspected of extra pulmonary TB, and that went with a, a lot of guideline, uh, uh, guidance documents for its implementation. But if you look at the scale-up by now, this is from 2015, but the situation is more or less the same. You see in the, in the upper panel, that is the this, this sales data of the cartridge by the, by the manufacturer, by Cephite. And you see this goes up, which looks pretty nice, but you have to be aware that most of that is sales in just two countries, South Africa and Brazil. And the other panel, what it actually shows, it's, it's a bit complex, but what it shows you is the ratio of smear examination to, to expert use, which means that the, that the lower, uh, on, on the left, so the lower ratios are the better ones, so you see a better uptake of expert. And you see that a couple of countries do pretty well, there's Zimbabwe, South Africa, Uganda, Brazil, but you also see that, and this is a log scale, you also see that the majority of countries don't have a very good uptake, and some countries actually have a, a very poor uptake, and I see Thailand is actually a, 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 among the countries that have a relatively poor uptake. So if, if we then look at those questions we asked about scalability, is it scalable? Does it retain effectiveness when we scale it up? There have been trials done in the meantime, pragmatic trials, that show that, and they actually all show the same thing. It showed that if you use expert, it increases the number of patients who are started on treatment with bacteriological confirmation, but it doesn't increase the overall numbers of patients started on treatment, which is very important because they, we, I mean, it's clear that in, in, in TB control, finding the cases, putting, finding these patients, putting them on treatment early is very important. And also that it didn't reduce mortality, which was hoped for because patients could be diagnosed earlier. This is a very complex slide. I'm not going to, to, to explain it for sake of time, but it actually tells us that this is mainly due to very high rates of empirical treatment. So doctors start patients on TB treatment based on clinical symptoms or and or chest x-ray despite a negative expert test or not doing it at all, of course. And that is especially the case in HIV-infected patients, but for, for to a large part for good reasons, but also uh, uh, HIV-negative patients. Another problem is underutilization of this technology because there are all sorts of logistical constraints and health system failures. And then the question about the, uh, about whether it's worth. So the originally the, it it was clear there was work that we actually did in our group that expert provided concessionary pricing is cost effective, but there are problems with the cost effectiveness is to, if there is a lot of empirical treatment. And there was also a question about affordability. With regard to the empirical treatment, this is from a 
a rollout trial that we did in Brazil, it actually shows that cost effectiveness is indeed very strongly sensitive to empirical treatment. So if you have a lot of empirical treatment, it, it becomes actually non-cost effective. Um, and the other thing is that if you roll it out in a country like Uganda, so the blue, he, the blue uh, uh, part is the, uh, the treatment cost and the red part is the diagnostic cost, and the diagnostic costs start to go up very quickly. And what goes up, so what is the x-axis, is actually it's a lower proportion of patients who actually have tuberculosis, which means that if you use it at the community level more for screening, then you see it becomes, it becomes non-affordable. I'll skip it and I'll move to the conclusions. First, there is increasing recognition of the importance of research for policy development in tuberculosis control. Two, translation of research findings into addressing deficiencies in or improvement of control programs is enhanced by active involvement of policymakers in the research agenda setting, prioritization of research projects, and dissemination of their results. Three, Guideline development at global level is increasingly evidence-based, but primarily based on considerations about efficacy or, for diagnostics, accuracy. And evidence needed by policymakers to decide about scaling up those new interventions also includes cost effectiveness and affordability, acceptability and feasibility, and should be relevant for the context in which CALAP is intended. And this is acknowledging contributions to the work that I showed that came out of our group or our collaborations. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kobelens. I think it's very, very beneficial for our people in this uh, uh, room here, especially you know, either for policy makers or uh, program implementers or even uh, uh, practicing physicians how to push our policy makers in our country. And the, the, the topics on TB, you know, isoniazid prophylaxis, and the use of gene expert is really a problem that we are facing now in Thailand. I'm sure there are lots of questions, but I don't, I don't think that we will have time to, 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 to discuss that. Uh, it's nice, after hearing the, the academic inputs you know, from uh, uh, professors, three professors, it's nice to hear uh, the perspectives from community person. Okay? Uh, how, it, how community feels about using or adapting uh, research finding into practice and policy. The speaker is uh, Mr. Udom Likit Wanawut. Uh, he is a, a social scientist working mainly in Chiang Mai, uh, more than an NGO, and he is uh, 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 the person who implements his uh, so-called, uh, instead of GCP, is a GPP good participatory practices and his student in terms of learning how we involve pub, uh, 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 community in, in our research, GPP, good participatory practices. At the same time, he's an active member of the, uh, the uh, community advisory board at Thai Red Cross Aid Research Center, institutional based uh, cap, not project based cap. So he knows everything about the, 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 the trials that uh, David Cooper mentioned. So he you know, gives the, all the inputs here. So he will give us you know, how community looks at this uh, problem. Mr. Udo, please. <coughs> Thank you very much, Ajahn Prapan. It's a great honor to be here. You know, the topic assigned to me is really challenging. So I think uh, the best way to do it is just use the PrEP research as an example. Uh, so we have to shift gear a little bit. My presentation won't have any uh, diagram, your know, graph, or uh, any uh, technical, uh, technical term. It's just simple uh, words. To get. Uh, first, let's start with uh, definition. You know, uh, I'm, my definition of community is uh, uh, limited. It's not it's specific. It's not encompassing uh, definition like Alan used at the, in the first day. That more compassing. I wish I could uh, use that with confidence. But in this case, I have to be more specific about uh, HIV-related uh, NGOs that working in the countries, and they they work in prevention or in treatments, and they can be community-based, uh, population-based, or faith-based organization, and that's also also including uh, support groups. And for research, I talk about HIV clinical research. It can be biomedical or behavioral. 
and socials. Uh, I forget one thing uh, after listening to all these speakers about definition of policies, you know, when, when I'm thinking about this, I'm thinking about in broader term about the national uh, guideline and not national policy. But I realize that uh, policy can be translated into, you know, uh, guidelines or uh, add the fields in the labs or whatever. Okay. Uh, it, it's kind of difficult to see whether uh, NGO or community people know about research or not. Uh, recently, there's a lot of uh, source for HIV information, research information, you know. But by the time it gets to us, it's filtered out, trickled out, and eventually it's kind of watered out a little bit. It depends on the messengers, you know. So the list of uh, the, the source here, you can you know, link from social media to CAP meeting, to academic meeting, you know, to the word on the street, you know. But a lot of, a lot of time, they rely on word on the street, you know, rumors, uh, friends, you know, neighbors, or colleagues, you yeah. know. So that, that cover, uh, because they're not scientists, you know, we cannot blame them, we cannot blame us for not understanding of this meeting. For, for three days, I'm sitting here, my, my head getting bigger and bigger because of all this scientific term, you know. Okay, uh, so that, that uh, get back to uh, this one, you know, when, when we talk about the uh, research, what is uh, community perception of our clinical research, you know? We, we heard from Alan yesterday, we just, okay, from guinea pig to subject is still subject, right? So when we talk to uh, Thai community also, we oh, guinea pig, yesterday we heard from, uh, about Q research. They, they still consider uh, themselves guinea pig in, in positive way, right? But in this case, it's guinea pig in, in uh, negative way. It's about exploitation. Another thing, even though we have uh, a lot of community get a chance to go to uh, uh, HIV conference, that speak, most of the uh, speakers are Thai, you know, but the language really is still there. You know. Most of them too scientific, too medical, too complex, you know, alien. I would call it a medicalist because it's medical is it's a little bit of Thai and a lot of English. You know, even the, the uh, presentation for Thai uh, for Thai meeting is still in English. It's not in Thai. You know, so a lot of people need uh, audio and visual to help them. You know, so if it's kind of translate to Thai, they can help them. Yeah. And another thing is the dichotomy between medical and scientific research and social and behavioral research. Most of the NGO and the community I talk with, they still to this view is as uh, incompatible, composing. They always complain too much medical research, too much medical, medical research, uh, and not enough but, uh, behavioral or social. They, they, they didn't realize that they have to go hand in hand. Both of them have to sometimes uh, biomedical take, take the lead. And you know, sometimes uh, social behavior take lead. Uh, and uh, in Thailand, you know, I think Thailand is, when you look at a broader picture, is a really good example of how uh, community participate in uh, that many channel that community representative can uh, participate in policy maker. Uh, it, uh, representatives of community or support group sit in uh, the National AIDS uh, Committee at the village top. Uh, and under that, they have uh, seven subcommittees. All of them have uh, uh, representatives of a community or support group there. And at uh, another example, a National Health Security Committee, they always are uh, representative of support group and community in there also. And another way that a community can participate in uh, policy makers uh, by being member of uh, IRB uh, or EC, you know. And another way is by lobbying, you know, go talk to the policy maker, you know. And another one is maybe directly or indirectly involved in advocacy, you know, uh, indirectly as at a uh, cap level. And uh, however, you know, this this look like uh, it, it sounds perfect, idealistic, you know. But, you know, there's always, uh, the trouble is always in the details, you know. When uh, NGO selecting the representative, you know, the selection process and the role of com community representation uh, and in this committee, it's not really clear, you know. Most of them, they not even talk about it. We know discussion is really uh, ad hoc and exclusive. I mean, the same small group of people got it by, so, uh, disclosure here, I am sitting in many uh, subcommittees also, you know. 
by the recommendation of my peers, you know, based on being CAP member. I don't, I'm not sure, you know, why I've been uh, nominated by them, you know. But again, it's always go back to the same group of people, you know. But the, another uh, troublesome thing is that the role and responsibility of us uh, represent in the community. It never de defies, you know, it's arbitrary, it depends on individual. Some people take it seriously, some people say, okay, it's good, you know, great. I'm a member of the community and that's it, you know. And another, th another uh, thing is that serving term is not, it's, it's kind of open end, you know. Uh, I'm a good example of it. I sit in the committee, a few committee, for so many terms. I want to quit, but you know, who else can represent me, you know. There's no way, uh, we, we can find no one, you know. Because the field is quite limited, it's really shallow. It's, it may look broad, but it's really shallow, you know. So it's, a lot of time it's like a best over. You, you, you want to quit, okay, you try to find your PA, the one that you can trust. Okay, why don't you be in the next term, you serve for a while, and let's see how it's going, you know. So it's, it's like a musical share, you know. One person leave for a while and come back again, you know. And another thing is that a little reporting back and community feedback is, is lacking, you know. A lot of represent, uh, the thieves in the community never report back to that, that group, to their peer, to their people, you know. It, it's just a really uh, non-existing or irregular. If, if there's, uh, they have to report, it's impromptu, you know, it's selective to the, the small group of people and it's undocumented and they, they have no way to tell why you do this kind of, uh, take this action, what is your position, you know. I, I, I try to do that, I try to report back. But it's just, it, it's worse than shouting to the wall. At least you shout into the wall, talk to the wall, you, you hear your voice echo back. This is shout to the boy, it's just gone, it disappeared, you know. I send email, feedback to them, not, no feedback. So after a while I said, why are you doing this, you know. So, it's, so in the end, it just follow the leader group, you know. The leader, the influential people, the vocal ones, you know, always follow those uh, decisions, you know. Uh, for the effect of the community representatives on policy, I think it's difficult, it's difficult to determine, validate, you know, because we, in the end, we, we just at the, at, the, uh, at the border, we are not at the core, at the center of policy making process, you know, we at the outer line. So it's hard to say, you know, it's, that depends on the context on times or even the political environment, you know. Uh, for example, universal health care program, you know, this is one thing that NGO really proud, you know, claim that it's their own. But in the beginning, you know, it's always, should we support this program because it uh, established by a crook policy by a infamous politicians, you know. So should we support it, you know, who own it, who initiate this, you know, whether it's academic civil society or corrupt leader or populist uh, politician. At, in the beginning, it's always arguing debate about this. But one is set down, you know, one, when people appreciate this, uh, like the program, so everybody claim it, you know. So that reminds me of black cat, white cat maxims, you know. Doesn't matter as long as it's cat, the mice, and play with it, it's okay with me, you know. So it also remind me of success has many fathers, you know, and often. I mean, failures is often. You know. Now, uh, universal healthcare, everybody claim the fathers, you know, where's the mothers? I have no idea. So I think you know, in, uh, if I compare, you know, I will compare uh, the effect of community on research and policy, like building a house, you know. The people who make the house sound and functioning, you know, like architect, engineer, or the craftsman, uh, policy maker, researcher, administrator, lawyers, you know, academic scientists. You know. Why the community representative is kind of decorator and landscaper, make things nicer, practical, you know. Maybe it's, it's, maybe it's, it's just like facade, you know, decorative image of here. But I think it's also important for um, how to apply to the field. It's important to practicality, to quality, to accessibility, to fairness. Affordability. So I think uh, this is another burning issue for a lot of NGO and a lot of researchers. Ajahn Bapan, Dr. Nitya, you know, they always uh, know this. this is prep issue. You know, Thailand being involved in. 
PrEP efficacy trial since the beginning from IPEC, IPEC only, and ADAPT trial and uh, Bangkok Chronophobia study. You know. We also have a lot of uh, PrEP implement uh, research. And uh, we also have the uh, HIV and, preven uh, and prevention guideline in uh, 2000, uh, 2014. You know. And the National AIDS Committee, the, the big one on top, is really supportive for it. You know. However, PrEP is not available uh, you know, publicly. It's available through trial of levels. And no government PrEP program. You know. We wonder why you know, it's been so many years already, right? And another important thing that they are also generally true what are available in Thailand. That's quite cheap, right? And uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, public information about PrEP in, in uh, Thai, both in Thai language and English. I, I borrow this from, from the Thai Red Cross and from all the NGOs. You know. they, are, they are also in Thai and English. You see at the top there, aside for uh, English and Thai, you know. So it's not about language barrier anymore, you know. But uh, they're also about content also. So uh, to, to come back to a PrEP uh, example, you know, the high NGO uh, interpretation and acceptance of PrEP, you know, first is slaughter by myth, you know. Or PrEP is deployed to sell plattering drug, you know. The, the drug company want to sell more to what are uh, tenophobia. The sale is not good anymore, okay. And PrEP is lifelong. They keep saying that it's PrEP is lifelong. You have to take it forever. A healthy person have to take until you, you're dead. You know? and, and also, it's a, a, another thing that keeps coming and coming. It PrEP is inferior to condom. Condom is for everyone and for every occasion. You know? And for acceptance of, of PrEP is really lukewarm. You know? It's skeptical about efficacy, side effects, and drug resistance. Also, a question about fairness. You know? This is a choice about prevention and treatment. Prevention, there's a lot of options, but treatment, there's no option, you know. And I think another one is a Gilead phobia, you know, because the history of fighting with Gilead, they're so afraid, they don't want to touch anything that Gilead associated with Gilead, you know. And another thing, they're indifferent to, uh, to biomedical research. They partial to social and behavior, to myth, to rumor, to headline. I, I think in my time right now, I can, uh, uh, the, the example of UK decision on PrEP, this is another thing. The first time they, 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 they shared the news about the decision of the agency not to buy PrEP, but later action, they don't show it, they don't discuss, they don't talk about it. You know. I think uh, the NGO objection to PrEP, they, they're wrong for the right reason. You know. I think the stigma, of course, there will be stigma if they, they, uh, you promote PrEP you know, carelessly. If you prep, uh, stigma. So the, the question for uh, the, the solution for them is that prep for everyone, don't target it, you know. Keep it to everyone who want prep, you know. Just like a buffet, okay. You put it on the table, they come and choose it, you know. And they're always concerned about self uh, effects, short term, long term, you know, about on bone, on, you know, kidney. Of course. Uh, side effect, you know. So no prep, let not use prep, just use more condoms, you know. And drug resistant, okay, it's gonna resistant to treatment, I have a treatment to help the uh, drug. So no prep, use condom, condom safer, no need for lab, you know, lab work and testing. And cause, of course we talk about cause here. And right they said prevention uh, fun fun for prevention is not enough right now. Let's get more fun, but it's for condom only, not for prep. And of course, risk compensation. This is sure tell them that people don't use don't use condom, right? That's why they have an increase of STI. They say, okay, keep them have we have to give more condom to them. I think in the end, you know, objection to prep is well, or the renouncing prep is valid. So whenever ending is always keep going, you know. So I think the reason are couched in caution, well, intentional term, you know. Oh, it's not bias, it's not personal, I, you know. I'm concerned about side effects, about HIV, drug resistance, about fairness, you know, limits, resource. But in the end, I can't help whether I have a hidden agenda or not, because I heard complain again and again that too much resource on MSM, not enough resource for all the options, not enough resource for NGO that work in all the field. So I can't, I can't think about whether there's hidden uh, agenda. You know. So I think uh, I can't help that 
because of the entrenched uh, condom promotion, we become condom junkies, you know, because confident in condom back into uh, family planning, area, you know, because it's so successful, right? And in the beginning of the epidemic, condom promotion is so successful. So we, we become entrenched in this belief, you know, he said, oh, it's worked before. If we work again, if we give them enough condom, you know. So, and uh, another thing, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to promote condom. It's so easy, anyone can do it. You, have a, you need model, you need condom, and loop, and show people, and have fun also, you know. So, and it's, all, it's also multiple purpose condom. It prevents STI, it prevents pregnancy, unplanned pregnancy, and HIV AIDS, of course. And it's only got uh, widely adapted by NGO and community based, you know. And another thing is um, condom was uh, mythologized, uh, you know, because condom one size fit all, you know, for everyone, for every occasion. So in the end, it's just a kind of reflection of the best experience with researcher and with pharmaceutical in the beginning. So this is my final slide, I think. And in the end, even though uh, the input of NGO to the, to the policy is not clear cut, but I think it's still research is vital to HIV prevention and treatment and eradication. And I think community involvement in research is valuable to research and scientists. It's enhanced a research a relevancy to community needs. Its community member recognize and appreciate the value of research and scientists. If you don't talk to them, why, you know, they don't value your, your contribution. Of research, yeah. And community input are essential to policy making, make uh, policies uh, applicable to real world situation. And CAP is a good place to start, but CAP alone is not enough. So uh, I think CAP, we need more investment in time and effort. You not know, just have a CAP and let them go, you know. I don't, that's not enough, yeah. And so I think researchers need to constantly engage community to keep them informed and educated. And community members have to be responsible for their input and educating themselves also, you know. Uh, this is one of the, the things I want to uh, remind them. And thank you very much for your attention, and I hope you enjoy your conference. Thank you, thank you very much, Mr. Udom. This is you know, something that we have never heard of in our last 19 years of Bangkok Symposium. But this is something that we need to know, need to understand, okay. Uh, just. Uh, we finish on time, but may I ask Professor Gail Henderson to come up to just to, you know, how do you feel about you know, the discussion that we have so far on this morning? Please, you know, a few minutes, then we will have a coffee break. <laughs> yeah, please go to the microphone. Uh, I'm sorry that I, that I spot her, you know, to, to say something. But uh, this is something that we need to hear uh, from uh, social scientists, uh, social researchers. <laughs> Just your overall impression about how to put research into uh, practice and policy, yes. So thank you very much for this opportunity to speak without any preparation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I have to say that many of the things, first of all, I stayed for the rest of the conference because of this session, because this is an extraordinarily important topic. Um, and I learned a lot from the translation of different um, tests and the, the success and failure of really complicated medical tests and the immunological versus vi virological uh, components of them. Um, and then, of course, I really appreciated the translation talks because that's where the rubber hits the road or that's where things can really fall down and where the local context means everything. Um, and I have to say, um, I appreciated the mention of 052. Um, my husband is Myron Cohen and he was hoping that David Cooper would actually say more about his study <laughs> and ask me to, if I had an opportunity to talk to, remind everybody more about that study. So, and um, this is a little bit of a joke between us. But um, one thing I think that, um, if there's anything that I would 
emphasize it's the the last talk because in my own work um, in North Carolina and in China and um, from talking to other colleagues I do think that what happens when you engage community partners is often you ask questions that you're actually not prepared to hear the answers to. Um, that you ask people's advice, you ask their, ex the acceptability. Sometimes those um, answers are really taken into account in implementation. But many times community partners, especially community advisory boards, which now are very commonly convened, um, they, I, they don't um, understand how they can affect studies. And then as an investigator who has used community advisory boards, I've often made the mistake of asking questions and I, that I wasn't prepared to actually hear the answers to. That in fact, I had made decisions already um, and I learned a big lesson, don't ask unless you want to hear the answers. So I would say um, the other things that, um, that uh, Mr. Udon highlighted very clearly um, was the, the, the lack of, um, of understanding on the part of the community advisory board about what their role is. And if there's one thing that I learned from his talk, it's that often feedback is given, at least in that format, and maybe not adequately used. And I don't know quite why that is here in Thailand. I, I think I'll stop now. Um, this was an extremely valuable presentation or uh, panel because th this is what happens um, where differences um, really um, can change health where um, studies can, um, the, where the results of studies can really make a difference. So I, I think all of the speakers were really quite extraordinary in offering us different examples of failures and successes that we can then take back to our local settings. But so, uh, th again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with no preparation. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Professor Henderson. It's a, it's a compliment to this session this morning. So thank you, and uh, please have a coffee break and come back in half an hour from now. Thank you.